everyone to Coffee with a Codex. Uh, my name is Dodd Porter. I am the curator uh, here, one of the curators here in the Kislak Center for Special Collections Rare Books and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this is Coffee with a Codex. Every week we bring out one or sometimes more of the manuscripts from our collections and do a little show and tell. <laughs> um, this week I am exceedingly happy and excited to have Shreve Simpson here to, um, to talk about LJS 278, which is a Persian herbal. Uh, Shreve Simpson uh, has her PhD in is art history mm -hmm. from here at Penn. No, well, no, no, <laughs> not at Penn. No, where did you get your? At Harvard. Harvard. That's all right. That's well, all right. My undergraduate was Penn. Undergraduate so I have was a Penn, Penn connection. That's, yeah. that's why I got confused. All right. And, uh, and so I'm just going to turn it over to her and she's going to tell us all about LJS 278. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for having me and giving me the opportunity also to, to look at this really fascinating but very, very complicated manuscript. First thing to say is that um, the manuscript is written in Persian. So like um, Hebrew and Arabic, for instance, it reads from right to left. So we'll be turning, we'll be looking at it in that, in that fashion. Um, the, um, the technical title of this work is the Kitabi Hayash which it translates as Book of Herbs. And this is actually a Persian version of a text that was written in or compiled in the first century AD by a Greek physician um, and a pharmacist and botanist named Dioscorides. And you all are probably familiar with his De Materia Medica. This De Materia Medica was then translated into Syriac and from Syriac into Arabic. And then in the 16th century, a Persian translation or Persian version was made. And that's what we're looking at today. Um, the Persian version follows Dioscorides' original uh, content structure, which is in five discourses. And this particular bifolio we're looking at is the beginning of the third discourse. Um, and the third discourse um, deals, with, um, deals with roots of plants and trees that are useful for pharmaceutical and medicinal purposes. The manuscript, uh, however, this manuscript um, is no longer in its original text order. It was once bound. I can see stitching marks here, here, and here, and we'll see some others um, more clearly in a, in a minute. But what this means is that really, when I say we have a bifolio, we're not necessarily looking at a bifolio that consists of two consecutive text uh, pages. The text here does not continue, but um, because somebody at some point very um, helpfully labeled this plant, I can tell you that this is the um, plant of the, uh, called the great centauri in English. And the great centauri plant is useful for, uh, when it's used for medicinal purposes to aid indigestion and anorexia. So, um, and here's the illustration on the verso side of that same uh, leaf is the lesser centauri. And I'm not sure, I assume it also was useful for in indigestion. I've marked a few folios here. Um, we're not gonna go through the whole thing, but before I even go further, you'll see that this is basically the stack of the text block, um, which consists of bifolio, as we just saw, and a lot of single folios. And uh, at some point it was ditched together and bound. And uh, at some point it was taken apart. And even before the being taken apart, this poor manuscript had been through many different hands and suffered um, the, um, what, what do we say? The slings and arrows of misfortune. And many of the folios have been mended and many of them are torn and ragged and very stained. And that's just part of the fun of this manuscript, which also, is no longer in its original textual order, which makes studying it even more of an interesting challenge. Um, but here we're looking at um, a section of the text that um, depicts um, the myrtle plant. Oh, sorry, this is the carob tree, which has uh, long pods hanging from it. And then facing it, we get to a section of the text that concerns apple trees. So on the left, left folio, and when I turn to, it was for us to see the verso, there'll be more apple trees. But before we get to that, let me just point out that um, as you've noticed, the 
plants, for instance, on the, of the carob tree, the representation of the carob tree is not vertical. It's on the diagonal, as is this other carob tree down here on the diagonal, whereas the apple trees facing are, on, are represented as if they were growing from the ground up on the vertical. Uh, and this is typical not only of this manuscript, but of other 17th century copies of this particular text. And it makes one wonder um, when exactly or how exactly the whole thing was pr produced. Normally in um, Islamicate manuscripts, that is Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Urdu, et cetera, um, the, the assumption is and the practice was to write out the text first and to leave spaces for the illustrations. Uh, and in some instances, that seems to be what happened in this manuscript. But when you see things like this written on, uh, sorry, plants depicted on the diagonal, you have to think, well, maybe the plants were painted in first, and then the text was written around it. And by the way, um, for those of you interested in forms of script, this script is called, is a Nastalik, <coughs> excuse me, Nastalik. Um, it's a script that was developed in the late 14th century in Iran and was widely used in all the uh, regions uh, around Iran, including in India, which is probably where this manuscript was produced. Uh, Nastalik was used through the 16th and 17th centuries. It, the writing here is, um, that's why I refer to it as script and not calligraphy, because frankly, it's mostly very, very hasty. So it doesn't quite fall into the category of what calligraphy should be, which is beautiful writing. Um, Helpfully, somebody, um, helpfully in terms of trying to figure out the order of this uh, manuscript, which is uh, no longer in its original order, somebody came along at some point um, in the manuscript's life and wrote in red little late captions on the trees. And that's why I know that, for instance, that's a, an apple tree. And this is why I think this is a quince tree here. Um, and here's another case where the illustrations of the plants are sideways. And so the text was probably written around the um, orientation of the, of the plants. I've marked some things here just to, so we have a little bit of a sequence of things. Um, this is from this folio, is, it, um, is beginning, is part of um, the discor discourse about gums of trees. So all these trees, are a variety of lithium. I can't tell you much about lithium myself, but maybe we could all look it up and figure out what that means. But there are different varieties of lithium, and there they're depicted here. And then this is um, uh, this is yes a, um, a cistus tree, and it is this lower one has um, the property of a certain kind of a gum that was collected in mounds and was rubbed uh, against the legs and um, beard of goats. I'm not quite sure why, but in this case, there was this little snake that was added here to make to give the in indication that it um, had um, a kind of a relationship with other parts of the natural world. Ah. This is one of my favorites because it's such a sort of a explosive tree. This is the acacia tree. It's meant to have purple blossoms and they're here they're kind of grayish more than purple. Um, and, but this sort of beehive looking thing underneath it is actually the pod of the acacia tree. And that all of that is very helpfully labeled in red. Um, as I said, um, the ones that are closest to the uh, plants and trees themselves were probably added by uh, other, other readers of the manuscript, not the original maker of the manuscript. Oh, here's a wonderful case where it got sort of, the portfolio got kind of chewed up. And um, so here we're coming again, if, let me repeat if I didn't, clarify this at the outset. The text block of this, of LSJ27, LJS278 is not in its original text order. So we're going between all of Dioscorides discourses. And here, this is a folio that happens to come from discourse, um, let's see, discourse one, the fruit of trees. 
And the, the rubric here, which was part of the original uh, text, tells us that this is the, begins the section to discuss pomegranates. And ya -da -da, there are two pomegranate trees depicted here sideways with uh, more of discussion of their medicinal and pharmaceutical properties. And again, somebody's come in and, and uh, very helpfully uh, labeled, the, labeled the pomegranate tree and the, especially down here, the wild pomegranate. One thing that I find kind of fascinating about this manuscript is that, and I think it must correspond to the different discourses. And again, the manuscript is in disorder, so it's hard to know. It would be very, um, it's, there's no way to easily uh, tell the artistic in engagement, in, of, of, that is to say, of individual artists' hands. But certain, um, certain representations like these pomegranate trees, there's a there's uh, the very clear and um, very firm use of pigments and outlines of, of the leaves and very clear, very symmetrical um, depiction of the root systems. But then some other um, parts of the of the of the of the text, and here we're in a section of aromatics uh, or herbs, um, the the um, representation is much lighter and looser. And it makes me think that there was a different mode of representing like trees versus the mode of representing um, herbs. Oh, here's a case where really got a huge tear in the middle. So very sad. Now, I'm, going, I'm, still, I'm just going on through my little times here. I missed one, but we'll go to seven, which is uh, a section, a very nice section on um, roots and uh, herbs and roots from discourse four and none of these are labeled but comparing this text with um an other um other manuscript copies of the same text i think i've been able to identify and anybody who wanted to spend a lot of time which i didn't have to read very carefully through all the persian texts would probably confirm that this is something called rough bindweed and then there are two species of of water, uh, water chestnuts, uh, wild beet here, and um, another uh, interesting plant called barren wort on the other side. But speaking of reconstructing manuscript, if one really wanted to do a very serious study, could you, you, one could be, um, it would, be, it would help, be helpful to take note of things like up here, if you can see this, this is a pigment offset of another illustration that probably came in between these two, what are now facing, facing folios. So there was another plant on another folio that fell in between that was probably also part of this discourse of um, herbs and roots. And here also you can see very neatly where the stitching marks were, the original stitching, or maybe not original original, but because the manuscript could have been um, collated and, and stitched more than more than once. Uh, here is the um, I love this one with this great red bulbous root. This is the something called bird's foot or barren wart. And facing it and uh, is an, another um, poppy-like plant which I haven't I've yet to identify. But particularly interesting the way this is depicted with a lot of um, three-dimensionality and shading in the in the what looks like the poppy the poppy flowers and a very careful delineation of the the veins of all these leaves in uh, in different shades of different shades of green. It is quarter past. It is quarter past. All right, I'm moving right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, while you're while you're doing that, yeah. I'm just I want to see if I can zoom in just a little bit more. Let's see to get just a little bit more centered on. Without getting too much in your way, just get a little bit more of a. There we go. I'm 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 standing at the top of the camera, so I'm doing this backwards. Do you want to stand over that. here? No. Uh, I just need to. There we go. I just want to get a little bit of a closer view. 
Is that, is that going to be too much in your way? Uh, no. Okay. That's okay. Okay. There we go. Let's try. Let's try that. Okay. And we'll we do that. I'm going to skip ahead since we are. I knew this would happen. Then I would get excited about talking about things. But I do want to be sure that everyone gets to see some of the other non-plants, non-plant images in this manuscript. Um, because there's a whole section, one of the discourse two is about living creatures. And here we have, now, um, here we have, let me move this. Here we have um, cockroaches up at the top and um, a mountain goat, a ram, uh, a, um, uh, and a bear down at the bottom. So there's several mountain goats and rams. I haven't figured out what, exactly what that is, but um, presumably all these animals could have some aspect of them, their, their flesh, for instance, or in the case of the cockroach, maybe their shells uh, would be ha have some uh, medicinal value. Um, the backside of this folio also has uh, a, um, a fox, a donkey, and a stag. And last week, um, when Dot showed us a an anthology of prose and poetry, she mentioned and uh, drew attention to a place where somebody had, in maybe in either doing an uh, initial letter, I think it was, had dripped his red ink all over the place. Well, here's a case where the artist let his brush just kind of fly off, and where part of the brown from either the fox or the ass. Uh, ended up in, in a sloppy in a sloppy manner. Um, you've I've mentioned that the manuscript is in kind of um, not kind of in very bad shape, and that also extends to some places where my tea or coffee was spilt on pages, and then somebody tried to blot them off, and so that's why the, part of the ass I think and the text underneath him has been has been rubbed off because it was um, trying to dry it out. There's another interesting living creatures, and that's my tab 18. Let's see if I can find that. Oh. I don't see tab here. No, that's the one I'm trying to go through it this way. All right. Oh, here, while, and while I'm looking for 18, while Dot's helping me look for 18, these wonderful section of bul very bulbous plants. And again, notice how they're, the plants are kind of all over the place, which makes me, in terms of their positioning, which makes me think that they, you found it? I found it. You found it, good. That you makes me think that, they, that the plants were drawn in first and then the text was written around it. And here's a perfect example where the plants were drawn in and you can see um, so, uh, even some underdrawing here. And then the text was written in the middle and uh, the text that's written surface was these lines of text were um, then outlined in rulings and the rulings actually go over the leaves of the plant. So that helps us to understand the sequence of illustration. Um, here's another section of living creatures, um, which include fish, um, sardines and um, a fish I'd never heard of before called the sea gudgeon, G-U-D-G-E-O-N, a common small fish of the carp family. And, and the illustration includes something that the text discusses, which is there's a, one of these fish, one of these sea gudgeons is inside a boar. You know, we know it's a boar because he has a kind of fierce looking tusk. And apparently according to the text, when these two are, I presume, killed and cooked slowly, then the end dish, if you will, is useful as an antidote to um, dog and serpent bites. So you never know what happens when you join a, when you get a fish and a boar combined together. <laughs> this is Dioscorides at his best. And on the Verso side of the same leaf, which you'll also notice has a huge chunk missing from the bottom of it. There's a, um, what looks like a chalice with two salted, I'm sorry, into the, yeah, just pull, pull it into the frame. The okay, there we go. Um, a chalice <clears throat> with two salted fish here and another chalice on top of a kind of lattice-like table with two salted fish. At least that that's what the text says that they're salted to me. They just look like dead fish. Um, and those um, 
uh, are to make uh, midi, which is a fermented fish sauce. And a fer fermented fish sauce presumably also has some very useful medicinal, um, medicinal uh, properties. If I can get to 20, my ears can run. Here's 22, let's see what happens with 22. Oh yes, here's the um, 22 is, sorry, my, my um, marking. Um, is um, uh, from Discourse 2, which depicts cereals. And this, oh no, this is, sorry, this is not cereals. This is um, sumac. This is a, the representation of sumac with a gall, uh, stone, gall knobs on the, on the sumac tree. Here's something that I've struck me and I have no explanation for. And the margin here, it looks like, um, uh, almost like a wallpaper, kind of a textile pattern has been drawn in the margin. Perhaps there's some interesting explanation, there's undoubtedly an interesting explanation for that. So now how are we doing on plan, on time? We have eight minutes. Have I'd eight like eight to have minutes. a couple, there's some questions. So if okay. we have a couple minutes at the end, I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, six. Here we go, 26, another um, section from the living, another folio that <clears throat> belongs to the discourse of living creatures, <coughs> excuse me, including a stork, an eagle, a feline-like creature, and a weasel. And all of them somehow um, have some uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical benefits. Um, this is another uh, set of trees from the root section, or the, uh, sorry, gum of trees section, which includes something that looks like a beehive, but again, it's the excrescence of some of the gum of the uh, tree. <coughs> Finally, um, something we all can identify, I think, a rose, a rose bush. So roses have also their medicinal and pharmaceutical properties. Here's a beautiful rose bush. And on the bare cell of this folio <coughs> is um, the yellow berry buckthorn um, and possibly a red rose. At least that's what the labels say, but I'm not sure exactly. Um, in the Eastern Mediterranean where Dioscorides was originally uh, <coughs> collecting and describing plants, whether or not the red rose actually was had yellow blossoms on it, for instance. <coughs> and finally, um, since we don't definitely don't want to miss this and want to have time for questions and to answer your questions, um, 44. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. 44 is uh -huh, the um, Again, a section of um, Discourse One, aromatics. Is this showing up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a balsam tree, and two men <clears throat> are tapping the balsam tree for its sap. What's interesting, and there's a, so here are the two men, um, and they're each holding little dishes under, and you can see the sap running out of the tree. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. <coughs> There we go. And here's a vessel, a two-handed, two-handled ewer, which they have aside to they'll evidently pour the sap that they're collecting in these dishes. They'll pour it into the ewer. What's interesting, art historically, if I can put it this way, is that the very earliest copies of Dioscorides, which in the in the, excuse me, the very earliest Arabic copies of Dioscorides from the 13th century also include this rep, this image, the same scene of men tapping a balsam tree and with the same halo-like um, discs behind their heads. Now, the, in this case, the halo is nothing, does, does not signify sanctity, which it might, for instance, in a religious, a Byzantine or a European, uh, medieval European manuscript, 
Here it's basically a way to set off the heads of the figures from the background. And that was typical of a form of, of painting and figural representation in uh, the 13th century Arabic world, which is clearly continued into the, uh, into the early, early modern period. Sadly, what's happened also in, these, um, in the case of these figures is that their faces have been kind of rubbed and scrubbed um, so that their features are no longer, no longer um, clearly visible. And finally, the very last image. <laughs> I want to get used to this. I'm still kind of just trying to center it. Um, there we go. There. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is great. Um, again, so this is a bifolio, which uh, with <clears throat> folios, there, the, what we're, we're looking at two folios that were not necessarily in sequence in the original, when the manuscript was originally bound, but at least are part of the same set of, uh, of part, part of the same discourse of the text. And this is a discourse too that concerns pot herbs. And, but what we have here, let me sort of go back to the, yes. What we have here on the recto side of, the, of this folio is a representation of a wild turnip and a radish. Now they both, to me, they both look like turnips, but what am I now? And um, representations of uh, parsnips and something called goat's beard. And down at the bottom here, who would have guessed? These are black truffles, two varieties of black truffles. So again, all these plants had some value in the, uh, some medicinal and pharmaceutical value. And this manuscript, when it was in its original order and in bound, would, uh, would, and, uh, would clearly have been used as a kind of reference work for maybe a, a pharmacist or a doctor, somebody who wanted to take advantage of the the, uh, the scientific knowledge that has been passed down from, through, from centuries, really, we're, again, to reiterate the text originated by Dioscorides in the first century of the Common Era. And we're looking here at a manuscript that was made probably in India in the 17th century um, of, again, our era. So uh, there this, this, there's a whole sort of trans-global uh, and continuing um, interest and use of this particular text. And we can continue. And I'll just point out if we have another minute. One more minute. One, one and one more minute, fine, that's good. Cause I think we're coming to the end of a section of text and there was space left here for an illustration that never got, uh, never got added. So there are places in the manuscript, in fact, and I'm sorry, we, I skipped over somewhere. You can see little outlines of plants, but the plants were never fully painted. So the manuscript I think was sort of always a work in progress. And now as, <laughs> now as in the collection of the, of the Kislak Center at the University of Pennsylvania, it's definitely a work in progress in order to try to figure out what the original order and structure of the manuscript was and what's missing. Yeah, and I'll say there was actually a question uh, um, earlier about if, if this has ever been reconstructed, and I said no. We were talking about that earlier. Yes, but if there is somebody who is interested in doing that, I think <laughs> we have tools that can help you do that digitally. And so, talk to me. Send me an email because that would be just an amazing project uh, for for a student or for anyone who can read Persian and is interested. Yes. Exactly. Oh, oh, well, good. Oh, look. Aren't I lucky? I turned oh, over. So here you see these are the these are the original the equivalent of the underdrawings of a plant of a series of plants that um, then uh, the artist or artists would have filled in with color and completed so that they finally looked like something what like the plants on the on the facing on the facing page. Uh, just also a point of interest for those of you who um, um, are keen to see other examples of this same manuscript. There's a bifolio from the same manuscript in the Freer Gallery of Art. That's part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. There's one in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and also uh, a, a collection of the late Howard Hop Hodgkin, which um, I understand is 
has been acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So there are other, when this manuscript was disbound it, and taken apart, its leaves were, uh, began to be dispersed, which is, um, I'm sorry to say, a very common bait for Islamicate manuscripts. Uh, and um, is, but so, but the, the, the Schoenberg Institute here is very lucky to have the, what was the bulk of this manuscript, 172 leaves of it. So. Great, thank you. Um, so it's technically time. So if anyone has to leave, um, please leave. <laughs> um, but I am gonna pass along the questions so you can answer them and they'll be in the, in the video when we post it on YouTube. So if you have to run, you can catch the questions. Okay. Okay, so our first question is from Lubeck. Huh. Um, Dear Shreve, thank you for this initial study of the manuscript. I am curious if you see any variation from the Arabic version of the text. Variation um, textually, var variation textually, I don't know. Variation um, artistically, yes, I think there is quite a bit of variation. But to, to answer that fully, Vivek, one really has to do a kind of comparative analysis. And that is what um, needs to be done. Fair. Good answer. All right. Uh, next question is from Lynn Forrest Hill. Uh, there's something rather odd about the placement of some of the plants in the manuscript, as if some were added after the main illustration and had to be placed in the margin. Others look intentional. Parts of the arrangement really fascinating. So that was a, a comment. That That's a very good observation. Thank you for that comment because yes, it is um, what it, what you could put it very un. Um, unscientifically, you could say it seems like kind of higgledy-piggledy the way the, the plants and the herbs are placed on the are placed on the page. I mean, some like this one are very, it's pretty straightforward between the line of text. Others are all over the place. I <clears throat> suspect that uh, those were copied from another copy, another copy of the same text. And the other um, manuscripts of this same text that I've seen in reproduction only, in partial reproduction only, also have plants placed at odd angles. So it seems to have been part of the, if you can put it, the visual tradition or the artistic tradition or the scientific tradition of this particular text. Okay. So the next question I think is related. This is uh, from Molly uh, Sotheim. Uh, how typical how typical is it for illustrations in the manuscript to break out of the frame the box around the text. It's, it's very typical from the 16th century, late 15th, 16th century onwards. Um, and what we often see, but not so much in this manuscript, is that the ruling lines that inframe the written surface uh, then stop for whatever part of an illustration is projecting into the margin. But margins did become part, if you will, of the picture plane uh, the compositional plane of, of Persian manuscripts in the early modern period. And our last question is another one from Vivek. Um, <laughs> would you agree that several of the stylistic features, um, the scale of the book, the lack of a colored ground for the pictures, et cetera, are archiving? Uh, to me, this is what makes the use of Nastalik seem quite odd for a scientific manuscript, as in, it is out of step with the other anarchizing features. I think that's a good, um, very good observation. And I would say that this manuscript was not, was made as a, was made for as a reference book. And so it was done, um, and the, the Nastalik script is written very, very hastily. So um, archaizing is an interesting way of thinking about it. I think that we, would be good to think in terms of what the function of this manuscript was and that maybe when we put our minds to looking for, to it much more carefully than I've been able to do so far that we could figure out um, more clearly, uh, more easily, more specifically how, how the manuscript, why the manuscript was produced and maybe even the, um, the, not the individual necessarily for whom it was made or who used it, but the type of individual, and then finally how it was, um, how it was used. But there is an odd, it's an odd, I agree, it's an odd combination of script type and, uh, rep and image type. And that was our last question. Thank you so much.
You're um, welcome. Trees. And thanks everybody for, for joining. Um, hope I'll see you again in a week or some other time. And the video um, will be posted to YouTube as soon as I can get it up. So thanks very much. And we'll hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.